This is a CNA podcast. A few carefree moments for these children at an orphanage in Cambodia's Kampong Spu province. Some orphans in the country, though, are not orphans at all. They're kids taken from poor families and exploited to do hard labor and perform for unwitting international visitors. Orphanages are big business in Cambodia. Or at least they were. Authorities, with the help of NGOs, are cracking down on facilities that profit off these children. But some argue it's not a business and that it's actually for the betterment of these kids. Hello and welcome to CNA Correspondent. I'm your host, Teresa Tang. This is the podcast where our network of correspondents shine a light on stories from wherever they are in the world, bringing you behind and beyond the headlines. On today's edition, I take you to Cambodia and into the world of orphanage tourism. Our correspondent, Young Wai Kit, is usually flying around covering stories in the ASEAN region, and he joins me now in studio in Singapore. Welcome, Wai Kit. Thank you, Teresa. Wai Kit, first off, when I heard we were going to be speaking about orphanages in Cambodia, my heart dropped because back in 2007, I was traveling solo in the country, and a local man on his tuk tuk came up to me and he said, Miss, would you like to see something? So I followed him to an orphanage and there were children there in tattered clothing, but they were so warm and welcoming and they played games with me for quite some time. And then at the end of the visit, the director of that orphanage approached me and asked if I wanted to give them some money. And of course, I said yes. So I opened my wallet and instead of the local currency, he asked for U.S. dollars. And now I'm wondering, do you think I was scammed? Yes, without a doubt. And I say this because... Whatever you just shared is exactly the kind of things that people who are close to orphanage tourism share with me. The tuk-tuks, they bring you to orphanages, and quite often people who visit these places, they would see posters or even photo albums in English documenting how children lead their lives there and how your donations will make a difference to them. I cannot guarantee how much of your money that you gave that day would go to the children, but I can say this because I've spoken with orphans who live in these places where orphanage tourism was thriving. And I can say that on that day in 2007, the interactions you had with them, the joy that you brought, the encouragement and inspiration you pass on to these children will stay with them. I know this because I've asked them about it. Of course, I'm not glorifying orphanage tourism. Many people slam the sector. But I also want to point out that not all orphanages are run like that. There are legitimate ones that exist because they need to take care of children who are vulnerable. But unfortunately, some of them just go under the radar and things like that happen. The thought never even crossed my mind that this would be a business for somebody. So, okay, the government in Cambodia is cracking down because it's not only immoral, but it also just doesn't look good for the country, right? To have a reputation of misleading tourists and exploiting people's compassion. So in 2015, authorities launched a reform plan. Tell us about that. Right. That reform plan was a solution to a problem that they found. In 2005, which is around the time when you visited Cambodia's orphanages, that figure was around 150. So there were about 150 orphanages. In the span of 10 years, that figure tripled to more than 400. And that's when the authorities thought, hey, something is wrong. Let's do a study and see what's wrong. And they found two astonishing findings. One, many of these orphanages were unregistered. So they go under the radar and nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Two, 80%, and that's eight in 10 children who live in those orphanages, they aren't really orphans. They're there because their families were so poor that they send them there because they get a promise of free education. And when there is a supply of these children, agents go around to fulfill those demands from orphanage tourism places. So that's that. But the government now wants to put a stop to it. So it's auditing these orphanages that go around at least once a year, look at what goes on behind closed doors, and they get to speak to children. And where children raise points that, oh, look, I do have a family, but I'm here because I'm poor. Then they try and do what they can. They tap on NGOs. So these social workers will go to the orphanages, talk to children, link them back to the communities and look at what sent them there in the first place. So if the family has 
poverty issues, they teach, say, the father farming skills so that he can take up extra jobs. Or if, let's say, everybody, say, a family of 10, squeezes in a very small house, they give them materials to build a new house. So it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. The NGOs will work with families, come up with mutually agreed goals, and then when they can sustain that lifestyle for that child, they bring them back and then they have follow-up cases. And only when they meet majority of those goals do they close the case and move on. That's really encouraging that officials will take the time to investigate what goes on and to not only look at the orphanage itself, but also what's happening with those families behind the scenes. That is the sound of girls reciting from textbooks during a lesson, an example of some good work orphanages are doing caring for children until they have a proper home, providing them with some education. Waikit, tell us what a day in their life is like. How are NGOs reuniting kids with their parents? For your first question, I visited this orphanage called Seeds of Hope, and that's run by a Malaysian director who is supported by churches in Singapore and Malaysia. So these are legitimate orphanages because they work very closely with the government. And I must tell you, these kids lead a lifestyle that is even more disciplined than many of my adult (laughs) friends. They sleep by 9pm, they wake up by 5am, and most of their time is spent in school. So this orphanage pays for their school fees. They go to a private school about 10 minutes from the orphanage. When they come back in the evening, It's mandatory homework time. Once a week, they get your movie nights. Weekends, it's spring cleaning in the dorm areas. But then they get the free time on weekends. They get to be children. They get to run around and laugh. When I was there with my filming crew, we were invited to lunch with them. Nothing extravagant for us. We ate whatever the children ate. White rice, one dish of meat and vegetable curry and fruits. Very delicious. Like I said, not extravagant, but from my observation, simple but adequate. So your second question on how... NGOs rehome families. So the government usually gets in touch with its network of NGOs and right now the government doesn't have the capability or resources to do that themselves. So they work very closely with these NGOs. They will visit the NGOs, interview the children, like I said earlier, and they do follow-up cases. All right. Stay with us. Up next on CNA Correspondent More with Leong Wai Kit, he spoke to a former orphanage director who defends the profits he made off children. And we also hear from a child orphanage survivor decades after her abuse. Hi, I'm Adrian Tan. And I'm Crispina Robert. We are the host of a new podcast called Work It. We're here to get into the essential things that no one tells you about working and company culture from office politics to dealing with burnout. If you've ever wanted to eavesdrop on an interesting conversation by the water cooler, this podcast is for you. Look out for our episodes wherever you get your podcast. Welcome back to CNA Correspondent. Why could, surprisingly, uh, operators of some of these orphanage businesses, they're not actually in hiding. You'd think that they would be. They don't think they've done anything wrong, right? You managed to track one down. What did he say? Right. Firstly, they're not in hiding because orphanage tourism is not illegal. But there is a fine line between disciplining a child and abusing that child or making him work and crossing the line to exploit him. It wasn't difficult to find such an orphanage because my fixers in Cambodia heard of this orphanage that used to thrive on tourists. So we visited that area. It was closed down. We had no access into that place. But villagers whom we spoke to said, oh, we always see tourists year in, year out. Many of them were walking out of the orphanage, but it stopped because of COVID. It is closed down. But they did point us to where to find the wife of the orphanage director. So we approached her. We were very frank. We said, we are doing a TV documentary. Can we speak to you and your husband? They said, yes. Yes, led us into the complex. It is huge, Teresa. Ten football fields. Wow. Yeah. Near the entrance, there's a classroom. Further in, there's a residential quarters. There's even a cow farm. There's a building to host tourists. There's your living quarters and places for people to gather. Huge. And he was frank about sharing because he's already closed that down. And like I said, it's not illegal. From what I gathered, he made quite a lot of money because... He hosts tourists. He says he can host up to 70 people. He charges $15 per person and they can stay up to one month. So that's already more than $1,000 a day. On top of that, children are not 
just spending their time studying there. They do work. They work on the fields because the director says these children will need to work to, to support themselves because you need to plough the fields, you need to yield vegetables. So that's what they do. They also learn to weave baskets to make products to sell. And every day, they spend about an hour and a half to learn traditional dance. And then on weekends, they go and perform. Some of these performances can fetch up to 1,000 US dollars, sometimes two, depending on how grand it is. So I ask him whether he thinks he's exploiting children. And he says, no. He says there are negative views, but the positive side is that these poor kids get a chance to education. They get exposed to the world. Foreigners come to the orphanage. They get exposed to different cultures. They pick up English. But look, I've described this to a few people who work in child protection services and without a doubt, they say this is child exploitation. When you meet these children and you look at them, you wonder, I wonder, what's going to happen to them based on these experiences that they've had? How are they going to be impacted mentally, emotionally? And you met one woman with a really incredible story. Incredible is the word, Teresa. She doesn't just have an incredible story. She's an incredible person. I mean, she laughs easily. She has this very contagious sense of warmth when you talk to her. I'll share more with you about her, but let's just take a listen to what she says about her childhood. After both of my parents died from HIV, I was sent to live at the orphanage and then my childhood was destroyed. I never feel... A child anymore. We were badly neglected. We don't have food to eat. We don't have cleaning water to drink. We were hit badly violent because we being a kid, we being playful, we don't want to work. It's difficult to hear her story because she shared very painful experiences. She says she remembers being always hungry. And when volunteers come, sometimes they bring food and that's when she will stuff herself silly because she says she doesn't know when her next, not delicious, but next full meal would be. So she eats until she pukes. And on some days, they don't eat breakfast. On some days, they just eat rice with pickled vegetables. And these poor children are driven to hunger that they go to the rice fields and catch rats to eat. Wow. My heart sank. And so I asked her, her name is Sinet. Sinet, what was the lowest point when you were in the orphanage? And that's when she said, the lowest point for me was when I was raped by the orphanage director. She was 12. And it happened almost every night until she was 16. And that's only because a volunteer found out and they went to the authorities. And her words sent a chill down my spine, Teresa, not because of the experience, but also because of how she said it. There was this grim determination for her to suppress her emotions. She wants her story to be told. You can see that she tried her very best not to cry. You can see that her lips were quivering. One side of her face was trembling. And she was eerily calm about it. And that was what struck me because... This must have been such a painful experience to you that even after sharing this story 20 years on, the emotion still surfaced. It was very difficult for me. She managed to put that past behind her and really regain the confidence and sense of safety to talk to a journalist like yourself. What was this story like covering it for you? It was very emotional and you said it actually had repercussions for you in the days to come. Yes, I'm not ashamed about it, but when I was talking to her, I was the one who broke down. I couldn't control myself. And I'm a 43-year-old man who has covered my fair share of disasters, conflicts, murder scenes, crime scenes. And it was still painful to listen to because even though my questions were said in the words of a journalist, whatever goes in my ears and my heart, I listened like a friend. And I really couldn't imagine how difficult it was for her. One of the first things you notice about Sinet is that she also has a lot of tattoos from her neck all the way to her shoulders to her forearm. And I asked her what those meant to her. And she says these are means for her to cover up her insecurities and her fears, hoping that these tattoos will scare people off. I don't want to oversimplify her journey, but now she has turned her life around. And I want you to listen from the horse's mouth how she feels about her journey. When I left the orphanage, I was just a scared a little girl. It's crazy because I got panic all the time. I can't talk to people. I can't cross the road. I can't go to school. And I think getting tattoo is the cover of how I scare other people off 
from hurting me. It took me 20 years to where I am today. To be happy, I can say. To be able to talk about this and sharing and feeling not ashamed. The night after talking to Sinet, I had two back-to-back nightmares. The first was I was on a plane and it was about to crash. And my final words in that nightmare were, I love you, mommy. The next night, I had a dream about me and my younger brother. We are four years apart. We are very close. But in my dream, I was my adult self. My brother was four years old, tiny, cute, you know, fun. He was holding my hand and then he let go for a moment to explore somewhere. And he fell four stories down. I remember the dread and the pain that I felt in my nightmare. And this is just me after one session talking to Sinet. So you imagine how intense it must be for Sinet to have to go through these 20 years. Why, oh, kid, as journalists, we usually have to check our emotions at the door. But sometimes, like Sinet's story, it really just hits you and it reminds you that suffering is such a universal experience and we really feel for Sinet. Where do you think the future of Cambodia's orphanages lie? Do you think tourists are jaded or will there still be a steady stream of compassion and donations? I think there will always be kind people and there will always be people who exploit that. But from my observations and talking to people in Cambodia, especially the authorities, the government and NGOs and also UNICEF, they're very confident that this is not going to last because one, there's natural attrition. When the borders close because of the pandemic, the tourists stop visiting Cambodia and therefore stop visiting orphanages. And during that two years, orphanages also close down because of the lack of funding. And now they're also ramping up awareness. So journalists like myself doing stories like that also promote awareness for people. So they're quite confident that In the years to come, the only orphanages that are left will be the legitimate ones that are there to protect children as a last and safety net for kids who need help. That is really good news to hear. Thank you so much, Waikit, for taking us to Cambodia with those very incredible stories. The TV version of CNA Correspondent airs on CNA every Wednesday at 9.30pm. You can also catch up with them whenever you like on cna.asia. Follow this podcast version that takes you behind the scenes with our correspondents so you'll know when a new episode is out. Our podcast team is made up of Daniel Lee, Crispina Robert, Clara Ong, and me, Teresa Tang. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>